started. Um, just to give you an overview of what we're going to talk about, uh, how many of you are partners, current partners at CCN? Okay, so a couple of you are not. So um, I just want to give a little background on what CCN is, um, then we'll talk about how to apply. So who are we? Um, we are a nine county region. Um, that nine county region we call our uh, PPS, or Performing Provider System. So that's an acronym that I'll probably be using a few times throughout the presentation. Um, our mission is to champion new models of healthcare for Medicaid members, so our focus is on Medicaid Lives across our nine regions. Um, and we do that through uh, care coordination and community-based care um, to reduce expenses, and we also try to help our partners navigate change. We currently have about um, 180, closer to, maybe to 200 partners at this point. I don't know if we have an exact number. Melissa might have an exact number. 183. 183, okay, so our, our partners um, continue to grow. We're continuing to partner with um, more and more organizations. So if you haven't already uh, partnered with us, let us know after the presentation and we can talk to you more about that. Um, you don't have to be a partner to apply for innovation funds. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about that and the details of that. Um, so anyway, our uh, our footprint is is this map here. We go from Steuben to Delaware County. Our, um, our nine counties, are, we break them up into four what we call RPUs, or Regional Performing Units. Um, the, the region that we're in here is the south, um, and then we've got the east, which is Delaware and Shenango, the north, which is Schuyler, Tompkins, and Cortland, and the west, which is Steuben and Chemung counties. Um, so, and Bob will talk a little bit more about how we dis uh, distribute our funds across the four RPUs, but in a nutshell, um, we're, we break our PPS up into these four regions. So if your uh, organization is located in either Broome or Tioga County, you're technically a South partner. And if your organization spans multiple counties uh, across our region, you might be in part in, in multiple RPUs. Um, so who are our partners? Uh, obviously health systems. Um, we have uh, health homes, skilled nursing facilities, uh, FQHCs, behavioral health providers, um, and community-based organizations which we refer to as CBOs. Um, those are just nonprofit organizations or community agencies like um, the American Civic Association, United Way, things like that, human service agencies. Okay, so how do we, how do you apply for innovation funds? Um, so this is a, pro this is a funding um, pool, pot of money that we've had for three years. Um, in your folders, you will have copies of the slides for today. You also have our RFP, so the RFP is what you'll use to apply, and it has the questions right in there that you'll have to answer um, one by one, and make sure you have that, that full application before you submit it to us. Um, you'll also have a, a copy of, actually I don't think I put them in, I'll send this around. Um, this is a, a kind of a detailed listing of the awards we gave out last year, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the awards we gave out last year to give you some ideas. Um, but basically, we're looking for innovative ideas that do not are, are not already funded through our contracts. Um, so if you have an idea that's going to improve access to care for Medicaid lives or some other idea that's going to benefit Medicaid lives for the region, that's what we want to see. Um, and we really want to see collaboration too. So if you have something where you're going to be partnering with another organization, um, then that's even better. Uh, so what does a submission look like? You're going to have a narrative and you're going to have a budget attachment. The narrative is broken up into four components. So you've got um, a section on company info and within that section there's many, multiple questions. Um, you'll have a section on your business case um, with multiple questions listed under that. Um, the expected impact on Medicaid members, so how is your project actually going to affect and benefit uh, Medicaid lives? And then overall district metric impact. Um, so is there anyone in here, maybe I should flip the other way, who is familiar with DISRIP? Just raise your hand if, you, if you're familiar with that acronym. Okay, so I won't go into explaining what that is. That's um, a burden lifted off of me today. Um, but overall, you know, what, what is the impact going to be on, on this whole transformation towards um, an improved delivery system for Medicaid? Um, so this is word for word what the questions are in your RFP. So don't feel like you have to write any of this down. I just wanted everyone to be able to see these are the, the detailed questions under the narrative component um, of company info. 
And so in terms of scoring, this is 3% of your overall score for your proposal. So you'll want to, um, you know, just make, just be aware of that as you're writing your proposal, where you want to focus a little bit more of your efforts. Um, so just go line by line and answer those questions. And we can send you a word version of this that you can fill in. And then business case. So this is where you're going to talk about the, the, the business proposal or your project that you're going to be uh, applying for. So uh, this is very, very much the meat of the, the proposal here. So um, you'll see down um, the fourth bullet point has the plans for sustainability post care, uh, post CCN funding. So this is a, a, a piece of the proposal where uh, folks have gotten less points. So this is important um, that you will have a plan for sustaining this program beyond any grant that you were to receive. Um, and then uh, district alignment, as I mentioned earlier, how does your project overall align with district? And I think in the left-hand side of your folder, I've included all of CCN's metrics. Um, if you have questions on those metrics, you can let us know um, and we'll get answers for you. So that would be bullet point one. Um, community need. So this is really important. How do you know there's a need for your program? I've been a grant writer and a grant maker, and I can say this is very difficult to do without research. So if you don't have any research or um, data to back up your need, you're gonna, you're gonna be having a hard time. So, um, and we can help with that. We can help with identifying data for you if you don't already have it. Um, just let us know. Um, that's where you're gonna wanna talk about that. Uh, previous experience, if you've ever implemented this project before, or are you trying to um, you know, pilot something new, or are you trying to expand on something you've already done? And references or collaborations. So this isn't necessarily letters of reference. This is a listing of who you're currently collaborating with or who you've collaborated with in the past. Uh, moving on then, um, oh, sorry, Question. go ahead. With that, um, because we're a, we're a larger company that's spread over several areas, would it be the particular clinic partnerships or the agency? I'm gonna let Bob answer that one. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so obviously, given given the uh, the uh, the size of some of our organization, the, the the list of organizations you've collaborated with could be quite large, um, and so and it's it's not necess you know it, it, it's a it's a small percentage of the overall score, and so we're not looking for dozens of of, of these, um, but um, if you if you would highlight like three that are are most related to what it is you're kind of trying to do. Uh, you know, I think three would probably would be enough to get the max points on that, um, as long as they're relevant to what it is you're trying to do. Um, but I wouldn't put more than five, just because that's that, that, that can be unwieldy once you get probably past that. You could probably go on for pages and pages. Um, okay, so then speed to implementation. This is where you're going to talk about how quickly you can get your project up off the ground if funded. Um, quality metrics. Uh, how are you going to actually measure? your outcomes of your project. So what, what specific measurements are you going to be looking at to move the needle on and, and by how much? Um, and then overall value. So we're kind of looking for a cost benefit analysis here of um, based on our investment in your project, how many Medicaid lives are you going to benefit? Um, so there's probably some simple math you could do there to present that to us. Um, and then lastly in the narrative section is your district metric impact. So you're going to uh, probably want to take a look through that handout um, with all the metrics and see if any of those apply to your project and talk about how you're um, you're impacting those or any of our either of our um, our two high performance metrics which are the uh, preventable ED visits and preventable readmissions um, and then I think I got that inverted so bullet one is the preventable ED visits and potentially preventable readmissions Bullet two is um, all of the other metrics. Is that correct? Um, no, and so the, the difference between those two is that one is a direct impact and one is a direct, an indirect impact. Okay. Um, so if you're actively working on, say, high utilizers in your ED, that's a direct impact on ED uh, avoidable use. But if you're working on something, uh, you can pretty much tie anything to those two metrics indirectly. Uh, you know, they say that uh, you know, on a patient, 80% of the, the issues that are with uh, patients like this are, are usually social. So if you're working on something social, you, you may be very well helping uh, indirectly impact 
um, avoidable ED usage. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's the, the difference there is direct versus indirect. Okay, and where would they use the rest of the other metrics? Would they be so, the rest of the other metrics um, would be best aligned. So, the more that you can align the, if you go back a slide, quality metrics used to measure impact. So, the more that you can align those quality metrics with the metrics that we have, uh, and specifically, uh, there's an awful lot of information on, the, on, on this. Um, uh, metrics guide, um, but the fourth column from the left is says performance stat status, and it says P4P or P4R. So the more if, uh, the more you use P4P uh, alignment, because it's pay for performance. So that's if the PPS does well, that that helps us draw down the funding from New York State. Um, versus P4R, that's just money we get as pay for reporting. Um, we get that no matter what our performance is, and so. Uh, the, the more that you can align uh, the, the metrics that you're using to, to measure the impact on that project with um, uh, our P4P metrics, uh, uh, that can certainly help with regards to that, although it's not necessarily a requirement because we recognize that some of the projects don't easily align with some of the metrics that we have here, but uh, the evaluation team, uh, having done this for three years now, uh, well, this will be the third year, um, has a pretty good grasp on, on what it is we're looking for here. Thanks, Bob. Anybody have questions on that? Still? Okay, move on. Um, and then the last bullet point under the impact is um, improved access. So overall, how are you improving access to care for Medicaid lives um, and you know specifically to where physically are they located? Um, are you expanding the hours, the times? Um, are you expanding resources to them? So just elaborate on all of those pieces. Uh, within the budget attachment, so we want this on a separate page, uh, and you'll list your overall project budget, and you want to include um, any costs associated with acquiring, implementing, um, supporting your project. Um, you're going to want to follow the, the instructions carefully here to separate out your information between one-time costs, implementation costs, um, and recurring or ongoing costs, um, and include any assumptions that you have. So anything you have in the budget, um, make sure, or anything, rather, anything you have in the narrative, make sure you're kind of explaining that in the budget so that the story carries over to your budget and vice versa. So if you put something in the budget, make sure that you've either explained it in the budget or you've explained it in the narrative so that we know um, why, that, why that line item is there. Um, additional requirements, so we're looking for you to have a header on your, um, on your actual proposal that you submit uh, with your organization's name and then the date of your proposal. You want to label all your sections, so if you're not using the Word version of the RFP and just filling it in, you're going to want to make sure you have the same numbering as in the RFP and the same questions. Um, you're going to want to uh, have it signed by one of, uh, an authorized member of your organization to submit that proposal, um, and we want that electronically. So um, either as a PDF or a Word, you'll send that back to Bob. And those are due on January 31st. You've got about two months, um, 5 p.m. on that day. All his information is in the RFP uh, if you have any questions. And as far as scoring, um, I think I'm going to turn it over to Bob now to talk about scoring and distribution, and then we'll go into some of the past awards and some tips. All right. So if we, uh, you know, I think uh, I think Shelby's done a pretty good job of, of, of outlining each of these, but this is the actual scoring grid that is used uh, by the evaluation team. Uh, each of these items is is based on a range of one through five, five being the higher score, and then it. Uh, it just carries out, and uh, essentially what we do is uh, we take all the all the proposals that we receive, and and we rank them uh, just numerically based on their score overall out of five, and from there uh, we take that and we turn that into uh, we kind of just start at the top and and kind of just check off the boxes for uh, as we go down uh, based on awarding uh, kind of in th in this way, so we want to make sure. Uh, and this was something that we started effective last year, um, that at least 30% uh, of, of the funding goes to hospitals or health systems, and that at least 30% of the awards go to non-hospitals or non-health systems. 
so that essentially just means that any of the, either of those categories can receive anywhere between 30 and 70 percent of all the money. So that's about 600,000 to 1.4 million. Somewhere in there, each category of those providers will receive. Um, we also distribute the awards um, by RPU, uh, and it's based on an attributed life uh, methodology. We try to, uh, it's, not always, it's not always possible, you'll see last year we were off a little bit in, in one RPU, but for the, by and large, uh, we do like to keep the awards within 5% uh, of a population of an RPU. So if you take, uh, let's take our North RPU, because it has an even number. It's got 30% of our population. So we try to make sure that the innovation funds <clears throat> awarded to the North RPU are anywhere between 25% and 35% of the total pool. Now what we don't do is we take, is take that and then say 30% of that has to go to the hospitals in the North and 30% has to go to the non-hospitals in the North. Um, because the uh, hospital versus non-hospital is done PPS wide. So it's quite possible that in any one RPU uh, there could be one of those types of partners that receives nothing um, because that, that is managed at, a, at an RP, uh, at a PPS wide level. Um, we may, uh, depending on how uh, all of the ranking comes out and following these criteria, uh, it, it may turn out that some projects may receive partial funding. Uh, now we do recognize that if you've asked for $100,000 and you're awarded $10,000, that's probably not going to help you at all. Um, in terms of, of implementing the project. And so we, uh, at CCN, we've got a, a rule where we, if we do uh, allow for partial funding, we'll do at least 75%. And, and likely when that usually comes into play is as we get towards the final, uh, the last few awards, um, because there is a cap on the dollar amounts that we have available, uh, we, just, we just try and make that work so that we can do as many awards as possible. Um, and so we will do that. Uh, the other thing we will do, of course, and, and as Shelby uh, alluded to earlier in the presentation, uh, what, what we're not looking for is, is essentially things that are currently covered by the contracts that we have. Um, and, but that certainly doesn't mean that you can't have a proposal that is about expanding what is already going on with the projects. We received uh, several pro uh, proposals like that last year and did award some of those. Uh, so. Uh, it is not that, uh, it can't be about the projects, but it can't be about what we're already doing with the project. So if you can expand on that in some way, um, then that's all right. And so uh, this year we do have just over $2 million. As it, as it uh, came out last year, we did, uh, we did fully fund nine uh, proposals, and it came $4,237 shy of the $2 million, so we just... Uh, we just threw that into into this year, and so here you can see, uh, you know, earlier I alluded to the plus minus five percent. It kind of comes out to these numbers. So uh, you can expect that by RPU, uh, these are the dollars that that will flow into each RPU, uh, with of course the minimums and the maximums, uh, and then again allusions to the uh, the thirty percent, uh, and that's noted to be PPS wide here again. <coughs> So if we look at uh, the, la the first two years of the program, so uh, first year being 2016 and the second year being uh, 2017, uh, you know, a lot of funds, are, a lot of proposals received, 23 and 25, uh, a lot of funds requested, 7 million and, and 6 million. Uh, award rate is somewhere around one in three. Uh, that, that tends to, seems to be uh, where they come in. Uh, you know, we've, we've awarded, uh, proposals that have been, uh, I believe, as low as, oh, I think, I think 30,000, I think, might, might, might be the low, um, and as high as uh, over half a million. Uh, so it, has, it does range the gamut, um, but uh, given that uh, you, you do have this information, um, uh, if, you're in, uh, if you're in the West and you ask for $400,000, it's, it's not likely to get very far just because of, of we want to follow these rules. However, uh, again, based on, on the way it falls out, uh, you can see um, that we don't, we, we try to follow it as best we can. Um, I'll, I'll draw your attention to the bottom right corner and on this slide, uh, if you look at the East RPU, just because of the way it fell out, we were unable to hit the 8% and we ended up at 6%. Um, and you'll notice the funding in 2016, the West was just a little bit higher, so it ended up at 18%. But 
uh, by and large, we are able to do a pretty good job of sticking within uh, in the parameters. Um, and again, there and above that is the uh, distribution by organization type, and so you'll see that both years we did uh, hit our targets on that. Uh, this RFP was originally distributed on uh, November 2nd. We have received uh, a few questions since then, uh, and, and I do answer those as they come in, um, but then those also get published, uh, will be published on, on uh, December 15th, just two weeks from uh, tomorrow. Uh, any questions that are gathered from, from this group today uh, will also be a part of that because uh, and I know we're videotaping it, and, the, and, and that, that, that will be available to, to, to all to see. We do put all of the questions in one place anyway, uh, mostly so that folks don't have to watch the entire video. But uh, we will incorporate all those questions that we get today into that release on the 15th. And then, as Shelby said, uh, Tuesday the 31st at 5 p.m. for um, the due date on those responses. We are. Uh, we are expecting our independent uh, evaluation team uh, to put in uh, a fair number of hours the week following uh, receipt of, of these proposals. Uh, we are actually targeting the February board meeting, uh, which is, I believe is 12 days late, no, 14 days later. Uh, so within 14 days, no matter how many proposals we, rece we receive, this group will have to read them all. Fortunately, they're consultants, so they can work overtime. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, we, we made them aware and they're, they're ready to go uh, to be able to give this a quick turnaround because we know that the sooner that we can award these, these programs, the sooner we can get them off the, off the ground running and the sooner we can start making impacts on our Medicaid uh, population. Uh, that being said, I'll turn it over to our grant writer slash grant maker yeah. for tips. So I don't know how many of you guys are grant writers. Raise your hand if you're a grant writer or written a grant before. Okay, about half of you. So I thought I would just share some tips for grant writing. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, you do your homework, do your research um, to put that into the community needs section. Um, and don't assume the reader's gonna know that there is a need for your program. Um, if you've ever read grants, you'll know that that's often assumed, um, that the reader will know exactly what your program is and what it does. So always assume, assume that, um, that someone won't know what it is. Um, we can help with data, as I mentioned earlier, and in your folder there is a uh, form that you can fill out and submit to us. I think those are due in a couple of weeks. I think December 15th is the deadline. Uh, but if you need any um, analytics, uh, support, data support, just let us know what you need for your proposal and we'll get that back to you um, early January. Um, of course, we'll try to answer questions beyond that date, but. Um, we are trying to support as many as possible. So, yes? It seems as though this might be an online form as well. Yes, I think that um, we'll send, we can send that to you as a either PDF or Word, I'm not sure which version it is, um, so that you can fill it in. Yeah, I think some of them say like fill in text yeah. here. Tap here. So, yeah, yeah, don't tap on it, nothing's gonna happen. It's <laughs> just, this is just regular paper. And if you are a partner already, you might have gotten an email about that, I believe. Um, Melissa, you, did you send that, that out earlier this week? So if you are a partner, go back and see if you can um, access that. If not, we can send that to you. Um, just a little FYI, last year, uh, four out of the five community-based organizations that requested that data support were awarded funds. So that just highlights the importance of using data. Follow the instructions. Um, you know, it's, it's really not rocket science, but you do want to answer every single question um, carefully and, and read that carefully for the, the detailed um, information that you're going to want to include there and tell the same story in the budget as in the proposal narrative um, everything that is in the budget should be reflected in the narrative and vice versa don't wait till the last minute I think that goes without saying um, and then please don't send in a lot of additional uh, attachments or um, in additional letters of support we don't need that um, one thing that would be helpful if you if you say you're going to partner with and I'm looking at Christina if you say you're going to partner with an organization make sure that they know you said that and make sure that you um, you know you, that collaboration is is in existence um, if you intend to partner with someone just make sure you have that conversation uh, beforehand you don't necessarily have to send in a letter a letter of support um, that is an important piece of the process 
So um, just a, a couple slides about past awards. Um, so to date, we've had two cycles. This is our third cycle. In 2016, we had 23 applicants, and in 2017, we had 25. Um, and this year, we'll probably get even more than that. Um, and as Bob mentioned, uh, actually, the announcement of the awards is probably going to be more like February. Um, I think worst case scenario would be April. Uh, so in 2016, here's a list of all the awards that we made. Um, and I do have a couple of slides discussing the, um, a couple of the Lord's uh, awards. Um, also, the, uh, the 2017 awards are there. And I'm going to hand this out now. This is a, a, two, this is a 2017, um, you can just pass those around, uh, to 2017 awards. There's a summary in here of um, a 250-word-ish two, a uh, summary in, in this packet of all of your all of these awards. So you can kind of see the range of the proposals that we have funded. And this is actually uh, part of the RFP is to ask you for uh, this 250 word uh, thing so that uh, should your proposal be awarded, we simply take what you wrote and publish it. The first year we did this, I had to, I had to read them and all and try to describe all of them with, and trying to be safe with what I was saying. It was. Uh, so we just said the second year, let's just ask them to write their own description, and if you win, here it is. Yeah, so. it's just easier. Uh, so I'm just going to highlight a couple of our, our programs that we funded to give you an idea of what kinds of things you could um, come up with if you don't already have an idea. So in uh, 2017, we awarded a grant to the Community Health and Home Care um, for a nurse case manager program at Binghamton Housing Authority. Uh, and this program is based off of a program in Ithaca that uh, was very successful and they wanted to expand it into Binghamton. So they, this is from them, the savings um, of almost you know, $1.6 million in reduced health care costs. Um, they have a nurse who is embedded in the Binghamton Housing Authority who is working with low-income um, patients and, and community members. And uh, we don't have any actual data yet as far as their progress. Uh, because that award was uh, only a few months ago, but that is that is going on now. Um, they're hoping to reduce ER visits, uh, visits, readmissions, um, and preventable can't say that preventable readmissions, um, and overall healthcare expenditures. And they're hoping to um, become sustainable through um, managed Medicaid payers to fully fund this program long term. Um, some of the things that they're reporting on to us and collecting as a, as a program is obviously the number of engaged, number of residents that are engaged with their program um, and the percent of residents that comply with their medication protocols um, as well as the discharge, any discharge orders um, and their ability to follow self-care protocols. Um, they're checking the hospital utilization and comparing outcomes over time. Uh, it looks like they're also partnering with UHS and Lourdes to compile statistics on their ER usage um, and so we're excited to see what kind of data they have for us in the coming months. Um, going back to 2016, Lourdes was awarded a few grants. Um, one of them was the Emergency Department Navigators. We believe they had two navigators um, that were hired and they have seen, I think I have some data in here. As I put animations in here, <laughs> um, but they're linking uh, they're linking patients to primary care and specialty care providers. Um, they're they're spending time with the patients, which is really important. Oh yeah, so they met with more than 700 patients, and this was I think um, an update from September or maybe even earlier. So they've done um, they've done quite a bit. Um, they also do um, health screenings. Uh, the other program, another program we funded was their video conference for depression. So this is based on the Pearls program, um, and they have an MSW who has been trained through the Pearls program to uh, see patients virtually, uh, and they it's a short term, so you can see them for see her for up to seven times. Um, so here are some initial numbers uh, as of the summer. Um, so they're hoping to uh, decrease hospitalizations. Um, they, their score, their PQH9 scores have decreased um, of the patients involved. Um, and the general observations she shared um, were just that the, the lives are very complex of the patients she's working with, so there's, um, there's a, a lot of need for them to kind of access additional services. 
um, but it seems like they're working well through that program. Um, and as I mentioned, there's more detail in this handout if you'd like to see um, any of those other programs that we funded. So uh, I think we'll just open it up now for questions and answers.